Uh, good evening. Welcome to the 57th round of the Cairo Climate Talks. Uh, my name is Nadim Abdel Gawed. Um, I'm an economic researcher, um, consultant, and I've worked in environmental uh, research as well. Uh, I've had the fortune to work especially on topics of renewable energy and uh, water resources. Um, I've worked in the Middle East and North Africa as well as in Colombia, Latin America. Uh, and I wrote my dissertation at the University of London on the energy sector in Egypt. Um, I have the pleasure and the honor to be the moderator today um, with a range of distinguished uh, panelists. So uh, let's get to this. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and we know it's not that easy uh, with the weather. In over 55 sessions of Cairo Climate Talks, um, 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 we have tackled many topics that all feed into the impacts of climate change and environmental challenges. Session topics have ranged from clean technology and food security to public health and energy, to name a few. Today's talk is titled Biodiversity, Opportunities and Challenges, Key Outcomes of the CBT, COP14. As you are well aware, Egypt, for the first time in Africa and the Middle East, has hosted the CBD COP14 in Sharm el Sheikh uh, from the 17th to the 29th of November 2018. Under the theme, Investing in Biodiversity for People and the Planet. In light of this conference, today we will discuss the complex issues around biodiversity from risks to opportunities. This complexity entails the importance of including diverse stakeholders from governments and private sector entities to local communities and civil society organizations. As we approach the year 2020 soon, which is the end of the 2011-2020 uh, um, strategic plan for biodiversity, the COP this year was an opportunity for these stakeholders to meet and launch negotiations for a post-2020 global biodiversity framework. The framework is supposed to replace the strategic plan for biodiversity that has been going on since the year 2011. This year, around 3,800 participants took part in a wide range of activities in Sharm el Sheikh. Side events and plenaries that negotiated resource mobilization, financial mechanisms, sustainable wildlife management, and scenarios for the 2050 vision for biodiversity and global outlook. The high level segment of the CBD COP14 raised the question on how biodiversity is linked to the economy, including tourism, energy, infrastructure, industry, and healthcare industries or sectors to name a few. Complex questions around economic development and biodiversity loss had to be tackled by business leaders, government delegations, and civil society organizations, as well as representatives of indigenous communities. For instance, specific roundtables that found governmental and non-governmental leaders, as well as business associates discussing difficulties as well as solutions slash potential opportunities that mainstream biodiversity and infrastructure, processing and manufacturing sections. Leaders have agreed that the new global biodiversity framework should serve in the conservation of natural ecosystems and eventually contribute to, to the mitigation of climate change adversities. Seeing the urgent need to further act to tackle biodiversity loss, Cairo, Cairo Climate Talks gather today reputable panelists, gathers today reputable panelists from Nature Conservation Egypt, the Ministry of Environment, the European Union, and Environmental and Development Group. So our agenda today starts with a welcome address, uh, followed by a panel discussion, then a Q&A, and then please join us for dinner. Uh, now allow me to welcome Ms. Isabel Meering, Director of the DAA Day Regional Office Cairo, and our host tonight to commence the evening with the welcome address, followed by Mr. Felipe Mope, Head of the Science Department at the German Embassy in Cairo. The floor is open for Ms. Meering. Please welcome her. Yeah. 
dear Mr. Philippe Maupé, Head of Science Department and Head of Protocol at the German Embassy in Cairo, esteemed experts and panelists, dear Mr. Yasen Adi, our moderator for the evening, dear ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the premises of the DAAD Regional Office in Cairo. It is my pleasure to host you all today for the last CCT round of 2018 and actually the first one for me that takes place on our premises as I have taken over the directorship uh, in October um, this year. The DAD Cairo office has always been very keen and um, on its cooperation with the German Embassy in hosting and being part of the Cairo Climate Talks since its beginning. Today's round, which focuses on the opportunities of biodiversity and challenges, is a very special one since as already stated also by Mr. Yasser, it occurs in the context of the UN conference of the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, which was hosted, which was hosted by Egypt in Sharm el-Sheikh for the first time in the Middle East and North Africa from the 17th to the 29th of November. Preserving biodiversity on Earth is by far one of the most pressing issues of our times now that we must confront worldwide in order to keep our planet sustaining the welfare of the human beings in the future. But it is of course a race against time. Everyday climate change poses a danger to a certain species on Earth, air or sea, and thus endangers the wealth of genetic resources we have on Earth. Unfortunately, the pace of the alarm is getting louder every day. What took our ancestors decades to unfold its negative effects on our environment is nowadays taking us just a few years and sometime even only months. Time is running as we see every day. We can see ref reflected as well in how the rank of the discussions on biodiversity has been fast and steadily increasing in the context of the international development agenda. On the academic front, research on biodiversity in Germany is very well established and developed, and therefore it is ex essential to exploit the vast potential of German universities in this field more extensively. Germany, being aware of that, understands that global themes of this scale cannot be tackled in the context of national borders alone which is why the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, the BMBF in Germany, has made the internationalization of science and research on biodiversity one of its goals through joint research with other countries. If we look also at the DAD, at the German Academic Exchange Service, we will find that as of July 2017, it has been fostering 11 projects within the DAD program, partnerships for supporting biodiversity in developing countries, which constitutes of cooperation between 15 different universities in Germany and 18 developing countries around the world. I think this is a success. Now that Egypt is taking an active role and has hosted the first conference in the MENA region with regard to the topic, I am hopeful and optimistic to see the effect of that reflect in the academic landscape as well, where the universities in Egypt can soon be a part of Germany's biodiversity partnerships that could even expand to more universities in the MENA region, in the MENA region as well. Of course, restoring biodiversity is not just the job of scientists, academics, politicians, legislators, or even developed countries alone. It's rather everyone's job on this planet because it affects us all. Every time we contribute to climate change by misusing our natural resources, as individuals and states, we contribute to the demise and destruction of our own planet, our home. Therefore, in addition to the government's efforts, treaties and legislations, we need to raise the awareness of our people, form alliances with businesses, industries, and civil societies. We need to exchange ideas and information, and only then we can win the war of hearts and minds and restore our planet's resources. 
It's because of all previously mentioned reasons, I repeat my gratitude for having you all here tonight and I'm looking forward to the discussion of this evening. Thanks to the organizers for choosing DAD as a host institution and partner. And now I would like to give the floor to our esteemed guest and the head of the science department of the German embassy. Philip, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear Cairo Climate Talkers, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the 57th Cairo Climate Talks on the Biodiversity Conference that was held in Sharm el-Sheikh just like last month. So first of all, I would like to thank Isabel Mehring and everyone at DAD for hosting us here at our traditional CCT venue. And it's also actually for me the first CCT at DAD, even though we've had several dozens of them here, and if not more. Thank you also to Nadim uh, for your kind introduction and for moderating this event. I would like to congratulate uh, Her Excellency the Minister Dr. Yasmin Fouad, the COP14 President, and the government of Egypt for hosting such an important conference. And thank you uh, both from the ministry for coming, and thank you Dr. Hamdala Zidan for joining our panel today to give us your impressions of the conference. Thank you also, of course, to our other panelists, Dr. Mustafa Saleh, Dr. Ste Mr. Stefano Pangeni Ghetti, Mr. Mohamed Rauf for joining our discussion. Thank you. I'm looking forward to all of your insights during our discussion. And of course, I want to say thank you to our great CCT team, who again has organized an amazing event. Thank you, team. I don't know where you're hiding, but thank you very much. So, for us uh, in Germany, biodiversity is a very important topic and I think uh, Isabel already gave us a good insight of what's uh, being do done in the university cooperation section. So, um, if I may use the words of our environment minister, Ms. Svenja Schulze, nature worldwide is in a very worrying situation. The loss of species and their habitats is next to climate change, the second great environmental crisis of our times. And while we're making progress in some areas, for example, regarding protected areas, there still needs to be substantial progress in other fields, like that of agricultural subventions that harm the environment. In 2020, at the next UN Biodiversity Conference in Beijing, we will need to come up with a new basis for protecting the environment. And so I am glad that the international community was able to agree on a clear preparatory process for COP15 that also includes representatives from the environmental and business sectors. Germany will hold the presidency of the Council of the European Union in the second half of 2020 when the next COP in Beijing will take place and will be actively engaged in this process and will push for rapid progress with regard to protecting biodiversity on our planet. Since 2013, Germany has been supporting the protection of biodiversity with at least half a billion euros per year. And this makes Germany one of the 10 countries that have more than doubled their contributions compared to the 2006 to 2010 average. Vice Minister Jochen Flassbart, who attended the conference with an important delegation from Germany, stated, we will stand by our commitments and will continue to fulfill them in the future. But we cannot solve every problem with money alone. We also need to stop the great trends of destruction of nature. And this is not only a job for the countries of the South that have very rich biodiversity. It is also a job for Europe, where we need to show that we can reform our agricultural sector in order to do agriculture in a way that is compatible with nature. We also need to take into account our biodiversity goals in all fields, be it energy generation, infrastructure, or health. This is what we call mainstreaming. And I'm glad that this was a focal point during the high-level segment, and we need to continue to pursue this, chiefly through the informal advisory group that was formed to this effect. The loss of biodiversity affects us all in all sectors, and we need to find holistic solutions to these challenges that cannot focus on one area alone. Protecting biodiversity is not only an important goal to protect all species on this planet, but also because our lives and livelihoods depend on it. Nature is the basis of our existence and our economy, be it drinking water, agriculture, or spaces for recreation and tourism, which is particularly important for Egypt. 
we all need a biodiverse environment to survive. And I'm confident that if our countries, Egypt, Germany, and all the others together, work together with full commitment, we will be able to stop the loss of diversity in the next decade. So I'm very happy that we have this expert group of speakers tonight to discuss their insights of CBD. Thank you all for coming, and I wish you all a very fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Felipe. Uh, very important insights, and uh, amen to the holistic approach. Um, uh, before we start our panel discussion, I'd like just to highlight that uh, there are sticky notes around. I can see some of them, some of you guys are already holding them. So if you have any questions, please, please write them down and my colleagues are going to be walking around, passing around. Uh, so without further additions, please help me in welcoming our panelists for the night. Um, um, first of all, Dr. Mustafa Saleh, Chairman of Environmental and Development Group. Um, uh, Dr. Mustafa is an environmental scientist with 30 years of experience in consultation, uh, research development and teaching. Uh, he has been teaching uh, ecology and environmental science at Al-Azhar University since 1987. So please welcome him. Um, um, also, we have Dr. Hamdallah Zidane, Head of Biodiversity Department at the Ministry of Environment. Uh, Dr. Hamdallah is a professor at Cairo University, is an advisor at the Ministry of Environment, Chairman of Preparatory and National Committee, um, and former assistant of the UN SecGen uh, at the CBD. So please help me welcome him. As well, um, Mr. Stefano Pengetti is going to join us. He's the head of environment and climate change at the European Union delegation uh, in Egypt. Before coming to Cairo, he has been working at the European Commission in Brussels on sustainable energy policies and innovative financing. He holds a bachelor in law and a master's in European politics and administration. So please welcome him. Um, finally, civil society, uh, we have Mr. Mohammed Abdel Raouf. He's the executive director of Nature Conservation Egypt. He's a graduate of biotechnology whose thesis was a qualitative study about the genetically modified maize in the Egyptian market. He has worked as a consultant for a number of developmental projects while blogging about science, nature, uh, and technology in the meantime. In 2017, he took the position of communications officer at NCE, or Nature Conservation Egypt, um, as well as the project manager of the Wadi Degla Virtual Museum funded by the UNDP. Uh, and now he's the executive director of NCE. So please welcome him. this working out. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And I'd like to welcome the audience once again. Um, so maybe we should start uh, with you, Dr. Hamdallah. Uh, and let's start with the basics uh, that, that are very important. Um, why is it important to address biodiversity and biodiversity loss? And how is this uh, related to climate change issues and what, why, why, why is this an important conversation to have, basically? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank you. Okay, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers as well as the host. And uh, I don't know how many of uh, you uh, know what does it mean, biological diversity, first of all. Uh, because this is one of the problems that we are facing that many people, they don't know what is biological diversity. And this is why we don't have the support that we need. In very simple uh, words, biological diversity means all plants, animals, and microorganisms 
as well as the environments and the ecosystems in which they reside. This is what is meant by biological diversity in a very simple manner, from the largest animal to the smallest organism. And these species, they react with each other, as well as with their environment, and as a result, they produce a lot of goods and services. They produce a lot of goods and services. Uh, many of these goods and services are not traded. We cannot assign a value. Uh, one of the simplest of these, for example, is oxygen. Oxygen is the product of biological diversity. As you all know, and you studied biology, many of you are, almost all of you in the secondary schools, and they, you know that the micro, the, the, the oxygen is formed by plants. And uh, I read a very recent, uh, uh, in fact, a couple of days ago, that uh, one person, in fact, was in the intensive care unit. And he said that he stayed there for two days and it costed him $2,800. $2,800. He did not talk about biological diversity, he was talking about that how it is very expensive, etc., etc. And if we look, we use oxygen every day, day and night, uh, uh, and we don't pay anything. And we don't pay anything. If you make simple calculation, this will come to uh, uh, hundreds or uh, even uh, of trillions of dollars per day, not per month, or uh, but per day. Uh, this is one thing. Uh, the other thing that take, for example, all the dead bodies, animals, uh, plants, humans, and see if we don't have the microorganisms that in fact degrade all these dead bodies. Just imagine how much would have been accumulated in our environment. Here in Egypt, we have a big problem about waste disposal. Waste disposal is a very big issue in Egypt, and uh, particularly in big cities like Cairo, and uh, just imagine if uh, all these uh, corpuses are not uh, uh, degraded. Uh, I'm just giving a few things, and if you look at the water we just were drinking, uh, it is purified by biological diversity. If you uh, take the pollinators, if you look at your food, all your food, vegetables, uh, uh, fruits, uh, meat, all these are biologic fish, all these are biologic diversity. If you look at all your medicines, most of your medicines are produced by biologic diversity. Say, take a very simple example, the antibiotics. Most of the antibiotics are produced by microorganisms by microorganisms. This means what? This means biological diversity is essential for life. But simply we take it for granted. We take it for granted because we don't feel that the loss of biological diversity is affecting us. Uh, when we talk about climate change, you, yes, you say that temperature is increasing, we have these uh, uh, hurricanes, we have uh, all these uh, extreme weather, and then we say, yes, there is climate change, and we have to work uh, to combat climate change. But if you talk to anybody about the loss of biological diversity, they say, but we, every day we have our food, we have uh, uh, our medicines, we have everything, so what is the problem? This is the issue. So the biological diversity was of great economic significance. And in addition to this, there is, you cannot there is no development of agriculture or this, this industry. Actually, this actually leads to uh, to the next question. We're mm. I, I know there's a lot to be said, and mm. thank you for the definition. Um, I think to make it clear for everyone, it would be great if we divide the topics then to subtopics. Mm -hmm. And actually, we're going to address the part on the economy, for sure. Thank you so much for the definition. And now I'd like to actually move uh, to you, Mr. Mohammed. And um, you've worked. Um, uh, Dr. Hamadallah just mentioned development and how it's related to biodiversity. You've worked in development and you've worked um, in uh, environmental uh, conservation. 
so from your experience with NCE and developmental work, how is biodiversity conservation related to developmental issues exactly, if you, if you would give it in a nutshell? Uh, well, um, biodiversity is um, like when we, let me start by, by how we are communicating it actually to our um, target audience, which is a variance of, of audience who are ranging from uh, experts in the field to uh, normal people in their um, uh, lives. So actually the word biodiversity is the least word we use when we're dealing with communities and development. You can build empathy with biodiversity while you're speaking about its components rather than its definition. So we speak about birds, plants, animals. These are the, our components that you can build empathy with and then from then we can start building the empathy with uh, biodiversity. Biodiversity as a definition comes on a bigger level when we're speaking about mainstreaming, when you're speaking about developmental products, when you're dealing with companies like, uh, for example, our, uh, the Migratory Soaring Birds projects, which was one of our, uh, the main projects of, uh, of NCE with a double E, double A. And we were like mainstreaming how the migratory soaring birds will be protected in the energy uh, sector. Uh, then the definition of biodiversity had an, another name and now we were speaking about biodiversity and its mainstreaming on a different level. But when, when we are dealing on a local level, when we're dealing with uh, students in schools, when we're dealing about um, youth and how they are uh, um, uh, they're building their empathy towards the environment, we're using different expressions and different definitions. And I guess this is like from the experience that we need, something that we need to build on, is that we need to escape from the word of biodiversity and not to be stuck in it because it could be a very limiting expression in itself. Because when you speak about biodiversity, you're speaking about a lot of elements and you, maybe you need to free yourself from this definition and to allow uh, better communication with the different stakeholders. That's why that's, this is, I could be, I, th I see it as a first start for, for all the discussion. Let's go into the components of biodiversity, not, uh, not to be stuck in, its, uh, in this word uh, alone. Um, and, and sorry, and just, just to clarify, thank you so much for this. And I'd, I'd like to just get back to the question and, and ask, so aside from using the term biodiversity, how do you relate these elements to, to development work or development issues? How is this, why is this relevant when, when you're talking with a, with a local community on, on developmental issues, things that they care about. So, okay, let, let's, let's get back and to speak about how the extent of the problem itself. Um, let me speak about some numbers. Um, uh, let me uh, use them. Uh, we used to be feed, fed on 7,000 species of plants. Now, in real time, we are, we are fed on only 15 species. We used to eat uh, and now we are only dependent on eight animal species. Eight animal species and 15 species of, of plants, they constitute 90% of our food. This is the extent of the problem we are speaking about. This is the extent of the, of the loss we are losing. Development is affecting biodiversity in all the, we are, when we are speaking about biodiversity, we are speaking about effect on the species, we're, uh, we're speaking about effect on the ecosystems, we're speaking about agricultural ecosystems and uh, forest ecosystem, marine ecosystems, the, our deserts. We are speaking about the loss of biodiversity and the extent of the problem that we don't really know the extent what we are losing because we don't have um, like specific figures about the extent of biodiversity. In each developmental project we have, we are losing uh, creatures that we really would, we don't have yet the capacity to be able to monitor everything we are losing. So we are losing things that we don't know, and we don't know, that we are losing biodiversity, and this affects, we, we will just know about it after we lose it. So it's, um, this, is, this is how much it is related to the, um, to the developmental projects. Um, thank you, and Dr. Mustafa, um, this maybe leads to, to then the question of policy. Um, and, and in light of the CVD COP14, what are the key issues that um, investors and businesses face in relation to biodiversity policies and environmental laws? If, uh, if you might, please. I, I think we should, uh, uh, the, 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 the policies and the laws and legislations that we have right now 
uh, treat biodiversity as a key resource that should be uh, at least thought of when you um, do development. Um, in our laws, we have environmental impact assessments requirements for projects. Um, and of course, among um, uh, different environmental elements, biodiversity is um, a key element that uh, is always looked at in these studies. Now, uh, perhaps we, we, you know, Egypt has been trapped more or less into this belief that uh, you can uh, benefit economically from conservation. Of course, this, on the long run, this is very, very true. But uh, we've been in the last few years uh, always talking about uh, that uh, protected areas should pay for itself and conservation should actually pay for, for itself. Uh, this implies that uh, an, an animal species that does not bring in money for us is not worth saving. Uh, and the same applies to habitat and uh, even uh, uh, differences within uh, different species. Uh, the problem with this is that w what we know about our biodiversity in Egypt, and I would like to concentrate more on, on, on Egypt and our region at least. Uh, Traditionally, people thought of the desert as an area with very low biodiversity. And they only have very few, very hardy species that can actually tolerate or adapt to uh, the harsh uh, environment of the desert. But this turned out not to be true. And um, uh, in Egypt and <clears throat> as well as in the rest of the Sahara, there are these new species that are being discovered all the time the so-called cryptic species. You look at one animal that you think it's one animal, you know, one species, it's uh, the Egyptian wolf, for example. But it's actually three or four different species that we did not recognize. And this applies to everything. You can imagine species that are not really iconic, like wolves. Other things, that simple animals, uh, rodents, birds, that appear to be of very low diversity are really um, uh, a, a very, very important resource that we should look at. It's, uh, it, 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 the whole situation is like uh, we have a, a big library with several million books and we have been able to read a few pages of some of these books. And if they disappear, then all the information, all the value that's built into these uh, species that we lose would be lost. I think, to answer your question, I think we should take another look at our laws and, um, and uh, of course, enhance re or support research that applies, that identifies <coughs> our biodiversity at the species level and, with the, at, and the intraspecific level, as well as the habitat. We, we, we might, you know, a lot of people have the impression that uh, the desert habitat is a very, very simple thing and there are few palm trees here and there, but it's so complicated and it has a, a, a rich and an extremely interesting uh, history that relates to, 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 to climate change that happened in the past. It's, it's a treasure that needs to be discovered and I think we should add a few things here and there on our policies and laws that are not sufficiently um, uh, enforceable, and enfor you know, because of, 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 of the, this pressure from development that uh, sort of requires, you know, uh, uh, direct economic benefit from uh, preserving biodiversity. Um, thank you, Doctor. And moving to Dr. Stefano. Um, so basically there are 196 parties of the International Convention on, on Biodiversity right now. Um, is this convention enough for the international community to address biodiversity degradation and its ramifications on climate change? 
Um, we do find a lot of cases where there are international conventions and there is a lot of international mobility among delegations, but at least in some cases it's not enough. And I'd like to hear your take on this, please. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a biodiversity uh, specialist, but uh, I had the chance to, to go to, uh, to Charm for the, the pre-COP meetings and I accompanied the uh, a delegation from Brussels, from, from specialists and uh, high level, we had the, our commissioner for, for environment. And, uh, you know, it's quite, it's quite fascinating, these uh, this, uh, conferences. So, uh, you know, it's not, it's not enough, for sure, but it's, it's a very important starting point. And it's an essential, you know, it, it's part of how we organize uh, international relations. So it's multilateralism, it's not just biodiversity, this is the way uh, we work. And this is, uh, you know, a great opportunity uh, for different, you know, state actors. Obviously, they are the, the parties, but also non-state actors who are being more and more involved in those uh, uh, framework conventions. So, uh, it's it's an important part, and it's the starting point of, you know, the, this, this change that we're trying to um, to engage. So, we, you, you mentioned in the introductory speech, uh, the you know, the strategic biodiversity framework up to 2020. We're not there. We have two years. Uh, obviously, there are still a lot to be done, and probably some of the objectives we have, uh, you know, this IGE targets, uh, they will probably not be achieved, but they are still very uh, relevant. So um, uh, then, how we move, you know, to, to to the next phase, which is the post 2020 framework? That's the whole uh, question. I think the, the the convention has been trying to start the work. Uh, I think part of the answers is, is, is probably, uh, you know, it, it has been also mentioned, awareness raising. So you have a role for different type of actors. You have a Im very important role for uh, governments because they are the one, you know, setting the rules. They are the ones to implement also the commitments in concrete uh, action plans and giving, you know, the, the, the regulatory framework, meaning you know, giving incentives, uh, setting rules, being able to enforce them, giving incentives. It means sometimes uh, it can be penalties if rules are not respected in the environmental sectors, but it can be also a lot of, uh, uh, for instance, fiscal incentives. And this links to the other sectors. We, there were a very interesting business forum for, for several days there, and I was really interesting to see that they are companies, and, and maybe not the, the first one we think of, but also large companies, mining companies who are, starting to get into that because they realize the value of the ecosystem and the services that the ecosystem bring to our economy. So not just health, of course, health, uh, food safety, um, but also uh, this has an economic uh, value. So some of these companies start to analyze you know, their impact and the benefit they get from the ecosystem and they start to integrate that into their business model, into their risk assumptions. So, you know, there are ways also for government to, to incentivize and to support those uh, front runners. Uh, and then we have another type of, of or another category of actors who are, you know, the, the, you can call it civil societies or communities who are the basis of the society. And, you know, uh, I've seen in Egypt, in many countries, you have very interesting initiatives, very uh, uh, interesting initiative coming from, you know, from the communities because they are the first one suffering from those changes in biodiversity and climate change and they, want, they are the ones who knows, they have the knowledge because this is their, you know, their, their close environment for a lot of them, their life depend on, you know, on small uh, fisheries, small farmers and sometimes they have you know, this, this historical knowledge of, of mitigating and, and <coughs> dealing with those environments. So it's all about <coughs> trying to link those three <coughs> layers, I would say globally, uh, and I think those conventions more and more give a space for those uh, three type of actors to express themselves. But and it's also the role of the government to empower also their community. So if you want it, you know, top down from the government that needs to set the framework, the rules, incentivize, support, give penalties sometimes if companies are not respecting the laws, but also support, you know, smaller initiatives that sometimes are very simple, very easy, and, and respond to certain needs or, or uh, problems. Yeah. Thank you. These are definitely um, actually uh, different points that are very important from the economic side to the rules. Uh, and we'll definitely be flushing them out a little bit more um, as we go along the panel. Um, 
my question is for Dr. Hamdallah, and please, if anybody else feels that they have something to add, please do after, <coughs> after the doctor. Um, rules and regulations have, have been mentioned a couple of times, at least, as we have, since we started talking. And um, um, given your work with the Ministry <coughs> of Environment, um, what are the key governmental policies with regards to addressing biodiversity in Egypt? And um, this is one part of it, but also there is the other part of um, actually implementation. <coughs> so, um, as as um, uh, as Dr. Mustafa was talking, there is there is one part that has to do with amending the laws, and there is another part that also has to do with okay, there is an environmental uh, assessment for a project, for example. Um, on paper, this is important, and this is happening, making sure that we're, we're, uh, we're taking care of the environment. But then, if somebody has worked in Egypt, we know in a lot of cases that this could be just, as we say in Arabic, or just paperwork, basically. It's just routine. Um, so, how would you look at the current uh, governmental policies, given um, um, Egypt's commitment to the CBD? Okay, uh, before answering this question, I want to go back to the link between biodiversity and development. Because development, you talk about economic sectors, agriculture, fisheries, forests, uh, uh, energy and mining, uh, housing, infrastructure, uh, industrial processing, uh, tourism, health. These are the economic sectors. All these economic sectors, they rely on biological diversity. And unfortunately, they also cause a lot of damage to biological diversity. Some knowingly and some unknowingly. If you take all these economic sectors, they use water. And of course, water depends on biological diversity. All these economic sectors, they, they use raw materials, take food industry, take uh, 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 the pharmaceutical industry, take any industry, they also use biological diversity. And in fact, it was one of these economic sectors that, that triggered the negotiation of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Because in the 70s, you are very young, you don't uh, recall these things. Uh, but uh, as you all know, the uh, United States is one of the biggest producer of uh, 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 maize, corn. And in the 70s, they started to produce high yielding varieties. In Egypt and in many other developing countries, we used to use our traditional varieties. It may produce only, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, one ton uh, or uh, a dab or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and the, the high yielding varieties produce much, much more. So they produce the high yielding varieties through the traditional breeding. And they started to commercialize or market these varieties to developing countries. So developing countries, in fact, they neglected their traditional varieties. And the high yielding varieties were performing very well for almost four or five years. And all of a sudden, the maize production in the United States collapsed entirely. Why did it collapse entirely? It collapsed because they started to see what happened. They found that there was a fungus, and the fungus is in the soil, and it never attacked the maize. The fungus, this fungus, Fusarium, never attacked maize. And so they were surprised how come that it, the fungus attacked the new variety. And they started their research and work, and they discovered that simply because the traditional varieties, the old varieties, they contained a gene in gene chromosomes, the gene, this gene enabled the maize to produce a toxic substance, toxic to the fungus, but not toxic to the humans or the animals. And so they want to again develop a new variety that also resistant to the fungus. So they will have to go back to the traditional varieties to get this genetic resource in order to develop their products. And so, 
any agricultural development, whether animal breeding or plant breeding, all this depends on biological diversity. Depends on um, biological diversity. Even biotechnology, the, the biotechnology, I'm all the biotechnology industry. It I'm depends. sorry, I, I will have to interrupt. It, it uh, depends. No, sorry, because if we have it, to link biological diversity to development. And, and this is exactly what yeah. we're trying to do. But it, I'm sorry, because we, mm. uh, we might be short on time. I'm sure it's very important, but it's mm -hmm. to, to, to link this, because you, you, you did explain why uh, biodiversity is important and how it is mm -hmm. related to different industries and to development. And this is why this leads <coughs> to the question, getting back to my question on governmental policies in the Egypt. Governmental policy in Egypt. What, what are the policies that are, that are there and also how, how are they being enforced or not? E Egypt has a very good environmental policy when it comes to biological diversity. In fact, it, Egypt was one of the countries that established the first protected area, Ras Muhammad, in 1983, 10 years before the Convention on Biological Diversity. And now it has 30 protected areas covering almost 15% of Egypt's area. And we have enough laws, enough regulations, but the main problem is enforcement. It is the main problem, not only in Egypt, but in most of developing countries. L law enforcement is very weak. And of course, law enforcement cannot depend on the government only. The people also should work hand in hand with the government to ensure that laws will be enforced. Um, how can people do this? I'm sorry, what, like in, in, in 20 seconds, how can people do this? How can people d do the role of the state in terms of law enforcement? In terms of law enforcement, for example, uh, if uh, there is a law that uh, prohibits, for example, the destruction of a forest, and you see that forest is being destroyed, then yeah, they have to go to the authority and report about it and insist that the law should be enforced. Um, um, thank you. And this, this leads to a question to Dr. Mustafa. Um, then, if there's a, prob a, a problem with law enforcement and, uh, and, and there is one argument that people need to do more, um, how is this related to... Egypt does not rank very high when it comes to transparency. We do have a corruption issue according to the index of, by Transparency International, for example. And when we're talking about business in Egypt, this is an issue. And so, of course, it taps into law, law enforcement. And uh, then um, nature con conservation and environmental laws, so on and so forth. How can we get beyond this point, basically, given that Egypt also has a difficult economic situation and we do have a development agenda that's important? And I, I think the key thing is uh, uh, awareness. And I'm talking about awareness here that covers or targets uh, the everybody in the country, including the, the decision makers. Uh, because it, it's very, very common uh, that people really uh, disregard biodiversity or wildlife or nature in general, uh, claiming that, uh, you know, uh, are we going to protect the gazelles and we still have other priorities, economic priorities? This is so bad here, and it has not always been like that, because um, many, many years ago, when I was a little kid, we were taught in school that are, there's certain birds that are protected by law, because, uh, and they, they, we had the uh, so-called friend of the farmer, Sadiq al-Fallah, the cattle egret, the wagtail, and the hopu, all these birds were known to every little kid in the country. And you would go, ride on the, on, the, on the train, for example, and there are pictures of these birds, you know, teaching you and building your awareness of, 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 uh, of course, how important these birds are and how beautiful they are and how beautiful nature is. This all disappeared. Um, and I, I haven't seen anything like that, although a lot of money has been spent on uh, public awareness, but I don't see any uh, impact of this. So awareness is a very important area. Uh, 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 abiding by the law is very important because uh, you know we're we're very very 
you know, lax with enforcing our uh, uh, laws when it comes to uh, uh, wildlife conservation. I, I'm still, ha I have to see one case of um, uh, somebody imprisoned, for example, for killing a gazelle. It never happened. It never was, nobody was ever prosecuted because of wildlife violations in Egypt. And this is so bad, you know, only, of course, I have to mention one exception, is when a ship hits a coral reef and uh, they take them to court and they, they, they find them. But other than that, uh, nothing is really being um, uh, done to violators, and I'm talking about violators that include the government. The government violates the law. And I have seen in my years um, one ministry taking over a protected area and, and, and nothing is happening. Individuals <coughs> doing the same and nothing is happening. So the enforcement is very important, but I think the key issue is the ignorance and the lack of awareness. Thank you, doctor. Um, maybe this, this leads to the role of civil society. So, um, um, Mr. Muhammad, what do you think um, are the, the key issues that, that um, face civil society organizations working on biodiversity? And how do, you de how do you see the role of civil society groups uh, among the different stakeholders that Dr. Stefano mentioned and, and others as well? Okay, so um, jumping over the administrative issues, like because this is not the place to be discussing this. I would be jumping on to the uh, uh, technical issues. How uh, NGOs are perceived in the equation of uh, dealing with the laws and uh, enforcement of the laws, and uh, as, as we have heard, so we have a great progress in terms of the laws we have. The environmental laws are quite developed, but we, ha we are lagging the enforcement and the application of these laws. Um, I, I think I, I will start by speaking about a practical example. We are working on the bird hunting issue uh, on the northern coast, and. Um, and the, it's, uh, it's against the law that uh, the, the trapping practices are happening, and we all know this, this is not legal, and according to the law, we should be prosecuting uh, many of the hunters who are depending on uh, the hunting practices for their uh, food. Um, we all know that this is not applicable. Like, we cannot uh, really put people in, in jail uh, in, in terms of like the... Can I interrupt you? Uh, but just uh, give me one example of a community that actually depends on hunting for food in Egypt? Um, the northern coast, the people in uh, Lake Brolos, uh, depending on hunting of birds. And Netting, quails, and other uh, passerines is, is not is something that these people do to make more money, but all of them are farmers. This is not their, we can't really refer to this as their livelihood. It's just uh, a greed, you know, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very bad, uh, uh, part of, of their culture that should be that if uh, in other words if you stop this uh, practice <laughs> these people will not uh, starve of Nothing course it's gonna happen to them they will lose a few pounds every year but that's it but it's there no no one in this country to my knowledge depends on hunting wildlife uh, as a livelihood it's a I, I totally agree, but in terms, but I know, and I know I'm contradicting myself now. <laughs> but I mean, this is there, you are speaking about the cultural uh, act that it has been really uh, like they are practicing it since a lot of generations, and they are depending on on doing this. So, uh, like, law enforcement now will be a very uh, an alien act uh, to be done on them. It's not going to be acceptable. Yeah. Am I allowed to interrupt just sure, sure, sure. Uh, I think very, very good. briefly? You know, um, the traditional way of netting quail and quails and warblers and other birds, okay, mashy, it's all right. But um, I, just, I just happened to last year to go and camp at a very nice area on the north coast. And there were nets everywhere. But I was so happy uh, because I woke up in the morning, early in the morning, and there was all these bird songs. You know, and I thought was really happy. It just turned out that these people have recordings 
that they, you know, to, to attract birds. And it, they have all this technology that it's so destructive, you know. Um, so this is not traditional. This is really a, 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 a something that would really wipe out uh, some of the population of our birds anyway. Sorry yes, yes, of course. I mean, we, we are, we, we are, and we are aware of this, and that's why we were speaking. Like we are starting our campaigns to uh, address the sound calling devices that we see that they are alien from the, the traditional practices. Yes, it's massive. It's like going to the, there, the seeing the the scene. It's really terrible there. But the thing is, really, to be to be really uh, realistic and aware of what's happening there, law enforcement without building the empathy, building the awareness, building the people readiness, like this threshold of people accepting that the law should be applied on them at this moment is something really sensitive. We should be aware of the sensitivity of something like this. It's not like if, if we tomorrow uh, go and, and decide that we are going to put people into jail because they are hunting birds, this is something we should be very sensitive and we are aware that this is not going to be very acceptable. Uh, and an of course, but I mean, <laughs> the, the, can I ask you a question very quickly? Yes. Do we have any law against uh, uh, knitting the uh, the warblers and uh, other yes. birds that are not protected? Uh, and incidentally, nothing is really protected. To to, to tell the truth here. Yes. Yeah. It sound calling devices are illegal, and every year it's stated in the. I don't think we have a law for that. It's no, no. It's in the ministerial decree. So the use of sound calling. It's it's illegal. It should the, according the, this will be they should the the law number four of nature should be applied on them because they are using uh, the sound calling device. It's illegal, but no one is uh, is enforcing the law. But but do we like as I said, this is question for this is, this question is how we are having every day in our life. Are we going to promote the law enforcement without really working with the people and giving them alternatives and and building this empathy that makes them ready to apply the law. I mean, you need to have a, a threshold, a minimum threshold of people accepting this law to be uh, um, like uh, uh, just on them. Yeah. So, so getting back to uh, the role of NGOs. So we are always labeled in this area of like NGOs are always only responsible for awareness only responsible for dealing with communities. And only taking this um, issue is like, it's NGOs, you can deal with people, do the awareness, go speak to them. But we are not part of the strategies enough. We are not part of the, uh, of the, the science uh, development enough. We are not part of the, like for example, we, Egypt has a national biodiversity strategy, action, uh, strategy and action plan. And it has clear goals and clear targets and I think it's an opportunity now to have all um, the sectors more involved in, in actually achieving these goals and achieving these targets. NGOs are not only this, um, you know, like another addition to the equation that they come and sit and they just present the, the people speaking about the awareness and the local communities. We need to have a bigger role and we, we, need, we should be more involved. I'm not saying that we are uh, able or not do, doing all our work, but we can be in the equation in different forms um, and do other things than only awareness or only you know being part of um, this uh, on the field work. If if you if you were speaking with the minister or the prime minister right now, what would be two things that you would recommend that they would do for or allow civil society to do more or NGOs? First of all, it's, uh, I, it, I will have a lot of speaking about the administrative issues. <laughs> Just, yeah, aside, aside uh, from the administrative this, issues this that is, NGOs face. Yes, this is something uh, completely. Uh, there, I, I would like to be uh, to align our strategies, like the strategies of NGOs and the budgets of NGOs and the budget, the uh, the national budgets and national strategies to be aligned to the same goals. I think this is a. This is a key part of uh, of our collaboration. We need to be a, a bigger part of the equation in terms of the execution of the uh, and on the field the things. Tasks should be delegated to us, and and collaboration should be uh, taking uh, a different uh, uh, forms. In other countries, NGOs are responsible for protected areas. NGOs are are, are 
doing conservation work on the on the field and they are taking uh, the, uh, the government is not um, you know, like taking uh, taking control of everything alone in in this uh, conservation sector um, so conservation NGOs can play a much bigger role than what's playing now it's not not our role only to do the awareness or um, we, we can be managing we can be uh, uh, doing science and we can be more in, involved in different levels thank you I mean, and it happened. I mean, why not citizen science? Uh, and 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 I mean, we can we can be part of this. Science science is open for for all sectors. Uh, academia can do science. NGOs can do science. Um, and this is, I think, this is the quality of science that many people can do it and can refute each other. And that's uh, that's uh, that's the nature of it. I mean, this is the, the this is the advantage of science. Does your organization has a strategy and action plan? Yes, and we are developing this. Yes, I mean we updated. And how uh, you implement? We implemented through. If you say that you have a strategy and action plan, and then you say that we are developing, and then I'm asking, if you have one, how do you implement it? Uh, accord. Do you have funds? Yes. Okay. So what? What are your complaints? I'm, I'm not. I'm not complaining, and I'm saying. I'm saying. You just were saying that the government is doing everything, not allowing us to do this, etc. No, no, no. I'm, I'm uh -huh. saying that it's good to have, like, it's not good to have only my strategy, my strategy of the NGO. But and, I have and you made, you made also a very strong statement when you said that in other countries or outside, all protected areas are managed by non-governmental organizations. This is not true. I don't say this. I said, in this is this is what you said. You know, <laughs> is Jordan, Jordan. Okay, that not, 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 not. That was. Not 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 everywhere you know not everywhere that they are managed by ngos yes, that yes, all I protected did, I areas say, i have uh, never uh, seen this let me let they have a role yes but those who should be managing protected areas should be the indigenous and local communities living around and within these areas not anybody else are they allowed in egypt are these communities allowed ah uh, yes if you take uh, for example saint catherine Protected area. Yeah. And it was led by an NGO. It was a more partnership. That's what he's saying. You need more partnerships. I'm sorry. I'll okay. Okay. Um, okay. This this was very healthy. Actually, it it shows like it was a live performance of basically what happens between civil society organizations and the government usually. Uh, <laughs> 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 Uh, and let me move to another uh, to another actor that could cooperate with the with the government in Egypt or governments in the region, which is basically the EU. And um, Dr. Stefano, what are the key opportunities and challenges for cooperation on biodiversity uh, maintenance between the EU and the MENA countries? Um, so you know the EU for for the EU, it's uh, it's one of the core value. You know, working in in, in preserving the environment and does it work? Right. Yeah. Biodiversity. So we are we are very active. Uh, you know that uh, we have an EU budget, not just for for development aid, but within the the EU, and uh, we have dedicated at least twenty percent of this budget that goes to you know climate or environment related uh, uh, investments. Um, in Egypt, is around almost forty percent of our support. Uh, which means around 750 million that goes to what we call climate related uh, um, uh, investments or, or support. So we do a lot here in uh, water, uh, wastewater uh, management, uh, in uh, you know, pollution, air, uh, soil pollution, um, um, solid waste management. So we are engaged uh, in, in, so not you know, indirectly in preserving, of course, uh, uh, biodiversity. Um, in the region, more, more, more globally, we have what we call so regional programs. Um, so we have, for instance, a program called SwitchMed that also benefited uh, uh, Egypt, that is mostly to support you know sustainable consumption and production. So trying to engage, you know, the demand and supply, trying to change. The, the production patterns, and there were very uh, successful examples in Egypt in the industrial sectors, how to be more resource efficient and how also to change 
this kind of paradigm, you know, not just talking about the environment for the sake of the environment, but also talking business, going to, to, to the companies and trying to make them realize that it's also about, you know, resource efficiency, being more efficient, being more competitive, saving resources. And on the other side, on the, on the let's say, the consumption side, trying to change also the patterns, consume less, consume better, reuse, repair. So there are a lot of things going on uh, at the regional level because the idea is also to exchange uh, experience uh, and, and support best practices. So uh, th there are other programs. We have recently launched um, the Climamed initiative. And this is a program that supports governance, climate governance. So the idea is, you know, in Egypt, for instance, there are already, you know, uh, climate uh, action plans and, you know, from, that stems from all the international obligations. So trying to see where we can help and support the implementation of, of uh, those uh, plans. So there are a lot of things uh, uh, already uh, ongoing, yeah. Um, just a quick follow-up question. Um, I'm not sure if you'd have the numbers at the top of your head, but maybe. Um, most of these resources and, uh, and support coming from the EU, is it usually with uh, governmental or non-governmental actors? So we, we, you know, we work in Egypt with, with... I know it's both, of course, but I mean with the majority of the resources directed to whom? Well, you know, we, we work here with, with the government. We have an association agreement, we have a, a partnership. And then when it comes to the implementation, we sometimes have uh, a you know, program directly with the, with the different ministries, but we have sometimes also, uh, uh, you know, call for proposal, for instance, grants directly for, it could be for SMEs, it could be for, for sometimes also the civil society. So we work with different actors, but obviously in partnership with, uh, with the government, yeah. Thank you. Um, now maybe the last thing we, um, we can tackle before we open the floor for the questions. We already have some of them. Um, maybe Dr. Hamdallah or Dr. Mustafa or both. Um, uh, we've seen the Egyptian prime minister at the high level segment of the summit uh, addressing biodiversity conservation uh, while pursuing, uh, and at the same time the government is pursuing its uh, macroeconomic plans for development. It has been mentioned already that there are opportunities from uh, activities that revolve around biodiversity and there are also threats, of course, when it comes to investment and private businesses. Uh, there has been also, like, given the government's plan uh, 2030 for development, there are a lot of um, mega projects, infrastructure projects. Uh, there has been the Chinese and the Brazilians in the summit, for example, talked about how can we uh, compromise or, um, or find, a, find a way where there are a lot of infrastructure projects that are being built and at the same time biodiversity is taken into account. Um, however, and, and, and of course our delegation agreed, but however when it comes to, to implementation right now, we can see the government um, uh, building a nuclear power station. We can see the government when it comes to energy also uh, they just got a Chinese consortium to build a, a coal plant in Al Hamrawin. So this sounds like a contradiction to me. Um, how would you address this? Uh, I uh, said before that all economic sectors depend on biological diversity. And at the same time, I said, but they also are the cause of biodiversity loss. But the, the level of loss resulting from different economic sectors vary from one sector to the other. If you look at agriculture, agriculture, in fact, is the main, because of the, uh, the, the uh, land use change, the, uh, the cause a lot of loss of biological diversity. But unfortunately, they also know that they depend on biological diversity. They depend on biological diversity. But they, what is the problem? The problem that they don't mainstream or take into consideration the issues related to biological diversity. And at this, of course, in Cancun, they talked about mainstreaming of biological diversity in four economic sectors, agriculture, fisheries, tourism, and forests. And these economic sectors, they know the value of biological diversity, and they know that they depend on biological diversity. They depend on biological diversity. But when they came to uh, Sharm el Sheikh, they focused on another four sectors, mining and energy, 
infrastructure and housing, uh, uh, industry and industrial processing, and health. Unfortunately, these sectors, they know very little about biological diversity. If you talk to the people, for example, working in uh, oil and gas industry, they don't know what is this biological diversity. If you talk about housing and infrastructure, we see that cities are expanding, eating the agricultural area. And, uh, and of course, if you expand a, 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 the city uh, expands, you need infrastructure, you need schools, you need, you need uh, uh, hospitals, you need roads, you need everything. And they destroy. So they committed themselves that they will, in fact, develop a, a sort of uh, guidelines and the process in order to mainstream biological diversity in these sectors. And uh, uh, the, usually these discussions used to occur between the ministers of the environment, the weakest ministers. Uh, but this time, in fact, they also invited the ministers concerned or responsible on, for these sectors. And they had roundtable discussions with co-chaired co by one of the our or by our uh, uh, responsible minister for a given sector and one minister from another country. And they committed themselves to this. And you have a sustainable development strategy. And the sustainable development strategy, they have to take this into consideration. And, and there is a need to enforce this. You need to enforce it. Otherwise, you are not achieving much. You can just come and uh, talk and talk, but I think at this, this time they will have to develop ways and means, including uh, incentives, disincentives, including all types of instruments to ensure that each of these sectors will take biological diversity concerns into consideration. Yes, I have a question actually. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Hamdallah, what do you think is the role of NGOs in supporting the Ministry of Environment to mainstream its work with other ministers? You just used the expression, the weakest ministers are the Ministry of Envi Environment. How we can help? It is the weakest everywhere. Yes, how we can help? Not, not only in Egypt, you know. Yes. yes. With, with, of course, I'm not talking about uh, some countries, very few countries where the Minister of Environment is strong. If you take, for example, uh, uh, France at one time, but he resigned at, at the end of the day, you know. <laughs> so, yes, yes, but really, really, how, yeah, the how NGO, we can help? The how, NGO, NGOs and civil society should be involved in all activities, not only of the Ministry of Environment, but all other ministers as well, so they can make change. Not only with the Ministry of the Environment. They have to find a role for themselves. Uh, when they look at any of these strategies, you can just say, okay, fine, I can fit here. So, so if we find a way to find our, we are supposed to look for our rules and decide what are our, our rules and say, we propose that we can help in this? Ah, yes, you can play a, a very important role. Can you give me an example, like like where you can see us working, how we can um, help really building the strategy of Okay, Egypt, uh, okay. The, what uh, and, uh, you want to be involved in protected areas? Uh, fine, right? Uh, okay. For example, uh, are NGOs willing to go to the protected areas in uh, Halaib and Shalatin and work there? We, yes. Just, uh, <laughs> um, okay. For for how long? We. We, Tw 20 seconds. <laughs> what, 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 what did you achieve? I, I mean... It, what did you achieve? Just tell me, you know. Yes, we are willing to go there. Do you, uh, do you want, are we allowed to go there? Can we work there? Is it, is it an option? Uh, can are we, you, ask, can are we you asking me? <laughs> you have the answer. You said that you have been there for 10 years, and then you say, uh, are we allowed to go there? They've been working for 10 years. Sure. Doctor, uh, Doctor, uh, Doctor Mustafa, uh, please. The role of civil society is important, but also I'd like to remind you that the question was also about um, yeah, mega pro yeah, I'm, I'm just, infrastructure uh, projects and question. economic activities. Sure. Uh, I would very, very much rather see an NGO managing a protected area 
than a private sector company building hotels and, and, and resorts in, in protected areas. Um, the, the government of Egypt, the Ministry of Environment, created all these uh, protected areas and they're just they're so big that they're totally unmanageable. And very, very little of, of this huge area is under any kind of management at this time. So at least the NGOs would have the sincere objective of protecting our uh, 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 natural heritage. So I would, th this is to, to, to try to answer your question. Let me go back to the issue of uh, the role of the government and, and all of this and development and all of that. Economic activities the and economic infrastructure activities. projects. We have in Egypt um, an organization called Land Use, National Land Use Planning uh, Authority, something or the other, uh, which actually divides the pub public land among different uh, governmental agencies for different purposes. I bet you anything, if anyone in this uh, authority or agency knows anything about biodiversity. It's, it's, it's really amazing uh, because, for one thing, and you mentioned one example, the Hamrawin uh, uh, coal-fired uh, uh, power plant, three megawatts, a huge thing, twice as big as the, uh, the, the high dam, built in the most sensitive or will be built in the most sensitive part of the Red Sea with magnificent trees. And I know that there was a committee formed by the WEAA, the Ministry of Tourism, and the Ministry of Electricity to select a proper place for that. And the Ministry of Tourism and the WEAA objected in writing to selecting that particular site. That's, that was totally ignored. And the studies are underway now to, to, to build this uh, power plant in Qusayr. Now, um, the, the position of the Minister of Environment? This they can't do anything about it. In fact, this, the, uh, and, uh, for, for some time, the Ministry of Environment was fiercely promoting using coal <laughs> for power generation. And uh, actually, the one minister was removed just to, to, to allow this uh, business to, to, to go on. Of course, it, you can, if, if you're building a, a coal-fired power plant, you make a lot of money. But all the people that would get sick, I would need you know, uh, medical help and, and all the consequences uh, on, on the environment are, are much, much, much more costly than any, any money that uh, Egypt as a country or the community would, would make out of this. Now, the, uh, to go back to the land use, they have, a, um, and the Ministry of Agriculture, an organization called Hayat uh, Tamiya um, Aftikr, Agriculture Development Authority or organization. They are given any part of the Egyptian desert that has any little vegetation and potentially some groundwater is turned over to this. No consideration of other alternatives. What if you leave these wild oases as they are with their gazelles and foxes and animals and keep them for tourism purposes? I bet you anything, you will make more money. So, but the, the single-minded approach of you know setting aside areas for agriculture with no studies of uh, potential um, alternatives is really wiping out biodiversity in this country and it actually did wipe out in my estimate 90 percent of our biodiversity in terms of habitat and species uh, so that's that that's regarding the so the government is actually playing a very very destructive role um, you know, in, 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 in the loss of our biodiversity. And they're probably not aware of it. Because uh, we've seen examples of ministers, cabinet ministers, who would not have any idea that we have, uh, uh, that, that, for example, the cheetah in the Western Desert is thought of as a monkey. Yeah, and I don't want to mention the, main of the, the name of the minister many years ago who was getting all these uh, letters from, uh, from abroad 
uh, help, tell, telling him, you know, to do something to preserve the cheetah. And I was asked to go and look for this monkey in the Western Desert. The people are getting writing, you know, many letters about it. So this is what we have. So awareness, 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 and education. We have, a, you know, I guess the. Um, yeah, why we, exactly? Thank you, thank you, doctor. Um, in 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 one minute before we uh, we move to the Q and A session, and I, it's probably not the best thing to be said when five men are sitting by the panel. But there is also part of the um, Dr. Stefano, since you attended the the summit. Um, if you can talk more about the insights that were told, I know part of the agenda had to do also with the gender and gen being gender sensitive to the issue of biodiversity and climate change. And so, if um, it part of the part of the uh, part of the summit was basically addressing this from a gender perspective and gender perspective, especially when we're working with local communities. I don't know how much this is related or not to your direct work, but it would be great if we can get some insights because it was part of the it was addressed in the summit. If if you can, if if this is not part of your work, then it's it's completely fine. I mean, I, uh, I was not part of this specific discussion, but definitely, I mean, to, to, to gender mainstreaming, this is something we, we, we are deeply, uh, you know, uh, considering about whenever we have a project. This is, this is one of these cross-cutting issues with also environment in all our projects. So definitely, I mean, I'm not an expert of the subject, but definitely we see that in communities, women empowerment can change a lot. I mean, in very different uh, aspects and environment is definitely something where where women can do can do a lot so it's you know kind of a cross-cutting issues uh, uh, but that's definitely something I don't know if it was specifically addressed in in, in the forum uh, but definitely I think you know maintaining also a gender balance and in, in you know all kind of discussion helps also to promote you know different approaches different uh, views and that's definitely something we, 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 we support in all our project and specifically looking also at the role of the woman in the communities, we see that it makes uh, a difference when, when we give them the right to, to be empowered and to also be able to, you know, to speak, express themselves, and, and, and also you know, engage into the, the, the debate, yeah. Thank you, doctor. Uh, moving to the Q&A, um, some questions were addressed to a specific panelist and others were, uh, were just left um, open, so please feel free to choose whatever questions of those that were not addressed to specifically to someone uh, to answer. Uh, the first is for Dr. Mohamed Raouf, two questions. But maybe we can take like a round of five questions and then they're answered and please try to keep the answer short because we're getting short on time and then um, we'll take another round. Um, um, so Mr. Mohamed, how do you think, is it possible to enhance projects startups by young entrepreneurs uh, to preserve the environment through biodiversity. Uh, and another question, as an NGO, do you have examples of such projects? A follow-up question. Uh, let me, uh, yeah. Um, uh, Professor Zidane, uh, the question is why the EEA does not publish uh, an accredited reports of biodiversity, what stops the biodiversity conservation uh, monitoring plans um, of 2015? Um, this, this question, this question is for any of the panelists to uh, to choose from. What is the role of the Ministry of Environment in mainstreaming biodiversity in education? Um, I'll keep this to make sure it, somebody addresses it. Um, and another question to Dr. Saleh. Uh, could you elaborate on the need to make our laws more specific? Why are ministerial decrees uh, less important? So maybe you would start. Um, so answering about uh, startups, so um, 
uh, yes, we, we, we should, we, we should any, any project should have in the environmental impact assessment. And the part I'm, I'm speaking about is not about the environmental impact assessment, but that after you, ha you start your project, you can, even if, you, if, if there are environmental impact assessment, then there's, you can do uh, mitigation measures if you have the, this impact uh, on environment. I mean, I just, I just want to express uh, it, use this opportunity to, to answer this question but, and also to express an opinion I have. So l let's be realistic about development because the development is going to proceed and, start, and youth are going to start to keep doing startups. This is, this is something that we cannot stop. The th the, what we can do is that we, now we are having a discussion about saving the planet. We are saving life. This is the kind of discussion that we need to have. And this kind of discussion is something that can be added to the startup environment and the, the entrepreneurial uh, environment and, and mindset. Imagine that you're waking up in the morning and you're thinking of mitigation measures of your project to minimize its in, uh, environmental impact. This is something that you should consider while you're doing uh, your, your work. We have to change the culture of now building startups to, to gain profit. Uh, and to build this consumerism societies and, and, and this kind of societies and to start thinking about really saving the, uh, the planet while we are, we are really grow while we, we are growing. It's a, it's a great opportunity that we can now we have by ministering by this diversity that we are providing a very moralistic mindset <laughs> to people and to youth against a very nihilistic and a very depressive times they are going through. It's a, it's a great thing that, that they can think that they are changing the world and they are caring about the planet. And this is an opportunity that should, we should build on. We are now having a gateway to speak to youth. And I'm really, and I think startups can, can be uh, um, uh, the entry point to this. Um, I'm sorry I don't have examples of projects. This is something we, we need to, uh, I don't have anything in my mind now, but I just wanted to, to say yes, this is something that we need to consider and we need to be working on uh, together. Um, uh, Dr. Hamdallah, please. The question why double E, double E, or the uh, environmental, uh, Egyptian environmental uh, uh, agency does not publish an accredited report of biodiversity what stops the biodiversity conservation monitoring plans of 200, uh, 2015? Uh, I'm going to uh, do my best because I don't work for the EEAA. And uh, uh, what I can say is that in, in line with the decisions of the Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, every party, including Egypt, they present annual not annual, sometimes biannual or, or every three or four years, report about the status of their biological diversity. And if you go to the website of the CBD, you shall see that Egypt had submitted until this moment five, five country reports. How, what has been achieved and what are the problems? So just to go to the website, uh, and of course, it is, I don't understand what does it mean by accredited. Accredited by who? It is there and on the website of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, see that CBD and see national reports and you shall see that there are reports of, for Egypt and they are preparing now another one. They are preparing the sixth national report and they made a presentation, in fact, on this sixth national report in Sharm el Sheikh during the COP. Uh, I, do, I, I don't know what you mean by the uh, monitoring plans of 2015. What? I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not looking at you. There are so many people in this direction. So, I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm just asking. What does this mean? I don't know. Yes. I, I, I don't know. You have to ask them. I'm just uh, ask, uh, answer the question about the national reports. Yeah, the national reports, which uh, absolutely has nothing to do with biodiversity, monitoring, and conservation of the biodiversity. It has no monitoring trends. 
I'm, so, I'm sorry, I disagree with you. I disagree with you. If you give me your uh, email, I'm going to send you the last national report, and you shall see that it is there. Um, 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 we'd please write the, the questions mm. down, um, since we, we just have to respect uh, the queue already. Um, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mustafa, there was a question to, to remind you. Uh, could you elaborate on the need to make our laws more specific? Why are ministerial decrees less important? And um, since, we, since we don't have enough papers for everyone to write their questions and their points, maybe we'll go question by question, but then we'll have to keep the pace faster. Sure. Very, very quickly, uh, I will point out uh, some of the really important gaps in our legal system regarding uh, biodiversity conservation and management. Number one, uh, the law does not give the WWA ownership of, of the protected areas, lands. And for some very, very strange region, uh, reason, you know, we've been pushing and trying to get the WWA to ask to be, um, to own the, the protected areas land. But they did, this never materialized. They didn't even try for some strange reason. So. Um, right now, there's a huge campaign to sort of de-declare protected areas and uh, develop it for different uh, uh, uses, economic uses. Um, there is some justification for this because of the huge areas that have been declared without adequate studies and, uh, of course, without management because of the limited resources. So the, the changing the law to give ownership of the protected areas land to the WEWA is very important. The second thing is our law, 102, does not identify different categories of protected areas. Everything is called Mahmeya, uh, protectorate, uh, which this is very dangerous because it gives the WEWA or the ministry or whoever wants the right to do anything with this protected area, starting from renting it or selling it or, uh, or uh, doing whatever they want to do with it or developing it or leaving it untouched. You know, uh, the, the IUCN categories were never recognized, were never in, uh, included in our law. The same applies to species. We have no official list of, of uh, red list of, of uh, species of animals and plants. And this is not included in the law, and the law should really make it possible for the government to, to go ahead and do it, and do it the right way, not just to, to sit here and say, I think the gazelles are endangered or critically endangered, or it looks like this bird is, is becoming so rare, so we'll make it vulnerable. You know, there are certain procedures that we should follow for this, and this would, could only be done if you have the legislation that mm -hmm. would support that. Um, thank you. Um, there are two questions that have the same theme, so maybe we can read them together and uh, please, whoever uh, wants to answer. Why isn't the link between biodiversity and economic prosperity discussed in schools? Uh, and there's also what is the role of the Ministry of Environment in mainstreaming biodiversity in education? So both have to do with education in schools. And one also mentions economic prosperity and biodiversity. Can, can I, I, I would <laughs> just say something very, very quickly yes, about one of them? Now, the, the inventing protected area was done in the United States, and they started the Yellowstone National Park, you know, as the first national park in the world. The declaration of the Yellowstone National Park and all the national parks and different protected areas in the states included that there, this, these areas are protected for the enjoyment of the, of the American generations, you know. Uh, and, of course, for preserving uh, a natural heritage, not for making money. You know, uh, we are ignoring this completely now. And actually, if you go and visit a protected area, you're not usually allowed to do anything there to even visit it unless you have a p permission, you know, and, it's, uh, uh, and uh, you, you can't even enjoy it. So now we're, we're teaching our kids that Protected, protecting biodiversity should be making money. 
It's a, it's a business-like situation. And it's so dangerous, I think it will kill your entire biodiversity. I, I think in the schools, the, if you look at their uh, biology books or uh, others, they started to uh, put a number of uh, lessons on biological diversity. They don't call it biological diversity, of course. They call it nature, and they call and and I think is 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 going well. And uh, very recently, there was a uh, meeting between the minister of the environment and the minister of education about this particular issue that you have to start <coughs> implementing or including biological diversity in the curricula for the kids up to the universities and of course with different uh, uh, levels and information. Can I add something on this part? At the Ministry at WEAA, they do have a full yes. department. At WEAA, they have a full department. It's Lil uh, Alim. It's supposed to be working with awareness. They work with schools, kids in schools with different levels, of course, they are round the clock working, meaning like within one month, they can visit b between 70 to 100 schools in different governorates to raise awareness about all environmental issues, not just biodiversity, climate change, and other things. I mean, kids today, if you do ask them, they will know. If you ask them, they will answer, what is climate change? They will know what climate change is. So this is one of the efforts that actually WEWA is doing. <laughs> Um, thank you. Um, there's a question on livestock. Why livestock production, um, um, animal farming effect on ecosystem degradation is missing from the world's environmental agenda? Uh, and it, no one is uh, like there isn't a specific panelist that is uh, that this question is directed to. So please, if if anybody would like to take the question. So basically, why is the issue of livestock production or animal farming uh, effect and its effect on the ecosystem degradation um, is missing from the world's environmental agenda? It's not addressed enough. It's not mentioned enough. In fact, again, this is one of the issues that led to the negotiation of the Convention on Biological Diversity when in the uh, Latin America, uh, particularly in Brazil uh, and uh, Argentina, when they started to clear the tropical forests in order to raise the livestock. And they were not aware that the forest is not only the trees. And uh, immediately after they did this, after a couple of years, the soil was uh, uh, eroded and, and uh, the whole issue was desertified. I can maybe elaborate because I wrote that question. Okay. and animal like livestock production and animal farming and how it make capitalizing on animal farming again that affects on all environmental issue, uh, issues and it's been missing from the environmental discussion and maybe I can direct it more to Dr. Stefano because you know again you've been having this conversation in Europe longer than we have and it's been missing even in the European discussions again about meat consumption it's actually a lot of studies just one simple fact uh, a lot of studies that meat consumption and animal farming has the single largest greenhouse emissions, more than even all transportation industry combined. So again, exactly, thank you so much. So maybe why hasn't meat consumption and animal farming and then again been missing from the discussion basically? Yeah, no, I think it's very, it's very relevant. Uh, they, they, you know, there are discussions that are not specifically targeting this, but you know, addressing agriculture, the way, yeah, the way, animal agriculture. yeah, animal agriculture, and also the, the, you know, land management, because there is also like a trade-off between, you know, uh, uh, crops and animal uh, farming and forestry. So all of these questions are discussed, but indeed there is the, the, the question of, of of the meat production and and, and yeah. consumption. No, I think I think it's largely a taboo. I mean, yeah, exactly. like, like no, especially. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's it's, it's clearly. It's but, but, 
but you know that th there is also the question I mean, maybe linked to that to gl generally about the CBD on how to because compared to the you know climate change conference there is a clear target there's a clear enemy which is CO CO2 or greenhouse gas emission for biodiversity obviously it's very linked to climate change but there are you know various a variety of, 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 uh, of factors. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the next challenges is also to define a bit more biodiversity and to be able to monitor biodiversity loss, but fix also a target. And there were certain people saying, I mean, very informally, but that one of the target could be, but it's very you know, controversial, mm -hmm. could be meat consumption. Because indeed, it links a lot to, to the CO2 emission, to the land degradation. So there is this ID growing, but indeed, it's still very controversial, and it's maybe more linked to certain, you know, um, yeah, and NGOs. And Okay, sorry. Um, just a logistical point. Um, the, the conversation, um, the, the lovely interpreters are translating everything that's happening, so some people are not able to follow the conversation when part of the conversation is coming from the audience without a mic. So this is why it's very important that we stick to this. This is not us trying to be horrible. <laughs> this is just to make sure that everyone follows the conversation. And that's really important because these are the Cairo Climate Talks. So this is us talking. <laughs> so it's really important that we use the mics. And this is, again, why we use the sticky notes. Uh, <laughs> عشان كده احنا بنستخدم الستيكي نوت علشان نتكلم فانا اسفه لو دي حاجه يعني مش 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 اسهل حاجه مش اسهل طريقه ندير بيها الحوار بس يعني علشان بس كلنا نبقى متابعين بس شكرا شكرا يا امينه وبس حابب يعني شكرا جدا ان انت قلتي النقطه دي لان احنا كنا كناش واخدين بالنا منها بس ال ال السؤال اللي انا قريته بالانجليزي فاكيد اترجم لحضراتكم اللي بيستخدم الترجمه كان على صناعه اللحوم والمزارع بتاعه الحيوانات وانه ازاي ان ان الصناعه ديت بتطلع ثاني اكسيد الكربون اكتر بكتير من من ميثين انا اسف من من صناعات ثانيه كتير وبس واللي سالت سؤال كانت بتوضح النقطه دي وبتوضح اكتر وبعدين انتوا سمعتوا المداخله بتاع الدكتور ستيفانو واسفين على اللقطه اوكي سو ذير از انذر كويستشن ذات هاز تو دو ويز ات سايز وي هاف تو توك مور اباوت اكشنز وات كان ايتش اوف اس ان ذس روم امبروف از اوف ناو فور ا فيرست تشينج تو كونزرف بايولوجيكال دايفرستي if any of the panelists would, uh, would tackle it, please. You have to decide for yourself. You have listened to the discussions, and then you have to decide how well you contribute to the conservation of biological diversity. Um, yes, I think, I think it's, a, it's an important that, uh, that we all uh, like to understand the threat we are, we are, we are facing. It's a, it's a moment to unite us. Not to, to divide this, and and I, and I see it. It's a real opportunity, and I'm, I'm I'm kindly I'm personally concerned about how this discussion is going into NGOs speaking to uh, to officials. It's not really w what we are intending to say. What I'm trying to say is that we are together in this situation. We are together working on this, and we are together. There's no benefit for anyone that we having this argument or having this. What's our rule? Together we can work to achieve the same targets. And we are facing the same threat. This is something that we need to work on together. And all sectors should be collaborating in this because we are humans who are going to be affected by this issue. This, this dis discussion about the CBD uh, uh, and the, the loss of biodiversity, it's speaking about humans. It's, it's this idea that we, we, we always have, like even in sci-fi movies, that when they connect people, they connect them against a, an outsider threat. And this threat is coming for us. It's, it's challenging us all. And we need to be working together. And um, that's why I cannot see any point of conflict between us. It's, uh, it shouldn't be, it, it, in this room shouldn't be any conflict. It should be together we're working on achieving the same targets. I think this is the first step that we need to, to start working. I just, I would um, like to add a, a, a few words here regarding this point. We've been uh, really busy seconds, talking please. about the globe. 30 seconds, please. I'm 30 sorry. Seconds. I, I hate to play this road. <laughs> you know, we're talking about global issues. Biodiversity at the global level. 
uh, but we have a, a, a very, very critical situation in Egypt regarding biodiversity. I think we should concentrate our effort on, 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 on the situation here. We, we have a, you know, a, a heart-breaking situation in the country. I mean, you guys are perhaps too young to have noticed this, but within one lifetime, we lost most of our biodiversity. So perhaps we can work on it now and we can do something about it, but I think we should concentrate. The situation is very critical and needs all kinds of efforts. No, thank you. That's, that was very important to be mentioned as well. Thank you so much. Um, a question to um, Mr. Stefano. Uh, how could the European Union policymakers face the rise of science deniers, uh, climate change and biodiversity loss deniers in the Western Hemisphere? For example, in the US and Brazil. Okay. That's, a, that's, a, that's, that's a spicy one. That's a spicy one. Um, <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, there are many things that, that, that are science-based, and I think the, the whole discussion is also in the CBD. You know, you, you, you have a panel. Huh? You have the mm -hmm. famous one for the UN framework and the Convention on Climate Change, the IPCC, mm -hmm. and the equivalent is, is the IPBS for the... So the whole idea behind that is everything should be science-based, and, and I think it's very difficult to to deny. I mean, if you're a bit informed and you go and you talk and you read the official reports, there's not much you can deny. Now, I mean, there's uh, more global issue about, you know, fake news and people saying things that become rumors. So it's more, and it's again, it comes back, it boils down to an education issue to make sure that kids at school have the right tools to verify themselves. And, you know, uh, not now I heard also in Europe that sometimes, you know, kids are challenging their teachers because they're saying, oh, it's not right what you're saying, whatever he's saying, because I saw this video on YouTube. And you know, so, you know, it's about also giving the kids the right tools to say, you know, if you see something on the Internet, it doesn't mean that it's right. Mm -hmm. You know, verify what is the source. If it's something that sounds shocking, then check if you see that in other, you know, newspapers and maybe... We need to learn uh, school like kids to use properly internet, verify, and, and be able to differentiate, you know, uh, sources. So I think it's it's more like a cross-cutting issues, but on biodiversity loss and climate change, uh, yeah, there might still be people denying it, but I think less less and less. Um, yeah. Education. Oh yes, oh yes, definitely. Thank you, um, Professor Zidane. Um, um, please, would you mind informing me, I mean, the person who asked the question, about the effect or interaction of biodiversity on the human genome, especially in health diseases? The effect of biodiversity on the human genome? Yes, on the human genome, especially in health diseases. In health? Diseases. It what? Um, uh, diseases. Um, in healthy diseases. Yes. In healthy diseases. Well, but obviously, I don't think that it has an effect on human genome, but uh, will, it is playing and will continue to play a very important role in the uh, uh, medical field because, as I said, most of the antibiotics. 99% are produced by microorganisms. Uh, many of the chemotherapeutic agents, in fact, are produced by biological diversity, are extracted from plants and from animals and from microorganisms. So it has a, a role to play when it comes to health and disease, you know. Um. Based on Egypt's strategy um, and implementation plan for 2030, which targets um, or uh, priority issues um, require more focus in the coming decade, where are we falling behind in our plan? Um, can maybe the person who asked this question clarify it? Like, get the mic and yeah. Is this working? Yeah. I just I just want to understand where Egypt stands um, in in the implementation of the plan for 2030. If there are any of the targets that we were lagging in um, 
more than others. I just, I just ha want to have an idea of where we stand uh, today. Okay, uh, uh, as you know, there is this, uh, the Badavisti strategy for 2011 to 2020. And uh, the strategy has uh, Aishi targets. There are 20 Aishi targets and you know, all this. And uh, until this moment, there's only one target that was implemented. That is the one on the establishment of protected areas. All other Aisha targets are not implemented, are or implemented to very, very uh, uh, little degree, you know. And this has been discussed, in fact, at the COP. And this is why they are now, had, they established the open-ended working group in preparation for or the development of the post-2020 targets, because they will look at why Aisha targets were not implemented. Why? Is it because the targets were very ambitious or uh, the uh, mechanisms were the, not there, whether uh, financial or uh, legislative or any other mechanisms, uh, or uh, they are not, in, cannot be implemented? And, 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 and in fact, should some of these targets be dropped or modified or carried over with the post-2020, and all these are still in discussions, but no single country achieved the IG targets. Thank you. Please. Yeah. So this is adding on Dr. Hamdallah's Dan words. This is how the, uh, how really um, we are really behind. Like we having we having this problem with no IG targets, and also like to give some cl clarification about the problem with biodiversity. Um, you comparing it to the climate change thing. In the climate change, you have the um, the measurable uh, minus two, two degrees Celsius that you, you were trying. This is a measurable way to say that you are now decreasing the climate change, uh, the decreasing climate change. But with biodiversity, this is not the case. We don't have one measurable way to say how we are decreasing the loss of biodiversity. And this is one of the challenges that are facing the, uh, the people in the convention, that we are not really able to, to evaluate uh, our, our progress in the, in the issue. And this is having... We cannot, it, 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 uh, we cannot compare biodiversity to climate change. The, the biodiversity, of course, the uh, spectrum is very wide compared to climate change. Climate change, yes, they came with this 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, increase uh, or 2 degrees Celsius. Uh, but when it comes to biological diversity, you cannot find something like this. It is, it is, it is impossible. Uh, um, the tour uh, disagrees with me. <laughs> I, I think it's, uh, you, you can measure success easily uh, if you really have been monitoring your biodiversity. Uh, say for example, the, if you take one um, indicator species and you have some estimate of the population size or even the distribution over the country. Take for example gazelles. How many gazelles did, did we have in Egypt? Uh, 10 years ago, and how many do we have now? Of course, nobody knows. Uh, but we can also say how much of, uh, of the country had populations of gazelles, yeah, and the occurrence of gazelles in different areas. We had, um, in the past, occurrence in 100% of the wild oases in the western desert and the wadis of, of the eastern desert. Now, it was probably reduced to 1%, which makes it critically endangered. Mm -hmm. So you can actually monitor exactly like you do with the, uh, with the global warming. Um, you know? uh, so there are many, many ways to do this. Otherwise, you, the, 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 the issue of uh, managing wildlife would be uh, uh, something really uh, useless. You know? Actually, it, I, it, I, it I don't want to disagree with you, uh, Dr. Mustafa, but I uh, am obliged. I have no choice. We are talking about climate change. They set a target for the whole world, the two degrees Celsius or 1.5. We are not talking a, a, about uh, setting a target for a species or for no. 
um, but, this but, but for for how how many of your public, uh, how many endangered species you have in the country this is one measure you, you, are you know about, you are talking about the national level yeah, at the That's national the level but i mean your your role uh, would actually translate uh, mm. uh, globally if, let's, if this applies to the whole world you know let's 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 actually the, this fits in perfectly with the last question to dr ziden um, sorry yeah um, which is basically monitoring and evaluation. Uh, do we have a monitoring and evaluation program in Egypt? Give an example, please. I think there are, uh, 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 there are monitoring and evaluation for specific activities and specific species, not for everything. You know, and, and of course, monitoring and evaluation is very expensive exercise. When you look at the budget of the Minister of the Environment, or the EEE, it is uh, peanuts. You have to be. Uh, we have to be realistic. I, I want to say something. So is, is this a no in, in or a yes? A conditional yes. The is this a no to the question or a conditional yes? I don't know. Maybe conditional no. Okay. <laughs> I say it's no. Uh -huh. All right. No, there are there are some, you know, there are some, of course, but not for everything. And but I want to say something. When I when I uh, read the concept paper, you know, the concept paper we did not talk to any issues in the concept paper. We talked about wildlife, and we did not talk about the link between biodiversity and the climate change. We are here to to do this, but I am I'm, I'm very surprised that. All the questions have nothing, are not related to what is in, your, in the concept note, in fact. We, we did talk and, about And in that. fact, in, at the COP, they, there are many, many things that happened. We did. One of them, for example, the Egyptian initiative. Well. Which is the initiative, what? Um, no, um, in, we hmm? did talk about the opportunities and challenges. We did touch upon the economic issues, the social issues. And well, at the well, end of the day... We well, did not say please, anything about the please. link between climate change and about their diversity, you know. Well, we did not, we did well, not talk even, about any... What are the results of this convention that took place here in Egypt and the, for the first time in Africa and the Middle East? We all, thought, all these things and when you see the title here and what has been discussed has nothing to do with what is here. Well, the title, the title is there, and I would, I would just like to add that people easily relate more to... Um, the key outcomes of CBD COP14. Nobody uh, has talked about pe this. Pe people do relate more to these things, especially mm -hmm. that we're having a public talk, and there are experts, there are non-experts, and I think people relate more to these things when it's about their lives, local communities, industries, the economy. So um, the, these were all there. But maybe they were not mentioned in the in the most academic language or the most um, jargon that that you would be used to. But they were there, and um, and and people's people's questions, of course, were said in their own words, in their own understanding. But they were all there. Okay, can uh, I can I ask one question to yes, yes. ask Dr. Hamdallah? Um, give us one example of wildlife monitoring. Um, in, in Asia. Yeah, please, one please we'll, we'll, do, we'll, do the, we'll do this at dinner, gentlemen. No, but, but can <laughs> we are we are we are we are barely on time because we started late. Um, but I would like to thank you so much all for your for your input, uh, and I would like to thank the audience for your questions and for listening and bearing all the debates. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll meet in the next uh, round.